All right, Scott, thanks very much for the introduction. As you said, my name is Dennis Lanahan. I am the Sales Director and Customer Service Manager for OWL Computing Technology, Inc. Um, we are an Encompass Partner Program member with a product that is specifically focused around cybersecurity. And it is a product referred to as a data diode. Some of you may have heard of that term before, some of you may not, but the goal of this next hour is to inform you and get you a brief introduction into the technology, where it's placed, how it's used, and the security profile that it introduces to network security. So, and also, this presentation is for you all in the audience. So if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand, ask your question. I'll try to repeat it to make sure everybody can hear it, and then provide you with the best answer that I can. So what we're going to cover today is a quick introduction about OWL, where we got our start, what we do. We're going to talk about the need for better cybersecurity. It's hard to turn on the, the TV or go to the web or a newspaper these days without hearing something about cybersecurity. So we're going to talk a little bit about where we fit in that space. We're going to talk about data diodes and defense in depth. It's a term that I'm sure many of you heard because there are a lot of different cybersecurity products on the market, of which the OWL solution is one of those products that fits into a defense in depth strategy. We're also going to get into a little detail about what is the data diode. I'm not going to get into too many details, but certainly enough so you can understand what the architecture is, how the product works. We're going to talk quite a bit about cybersecurity standards, specifically the ISA 62443 standard, which is a, a standard that a lot of our customers use to implement cybersecurity solutions. We're going to talk about that implementation specifically. We're going to talk about data that enables the enterprise, a number of different use cases. And then that take about 30, 35 minutes. And then I brought a product here. They're going to do a demonstration. And I'll put these two laptop screens up on the, uh, up on the uh, wall. And then we'll wrap up with any Q&A. So each of you should have received a um, small brochure. Didn't want to load you down with a lot of paper. There's some other copies up here. Also have business cards here for anybody that wants to leave with my business card. <clears throat> so with that, let's keep moving. So. The concept of a data diode is not new. OWL has been in business for over 16 years, so this is not new technology that I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is technology that has been used throughout our government markets in the intelligence agencies and the DOD that we are now bringing to the critical infrastructure market. It's a patented pr proprietary dual diode technology it's hardware enforced with a network protocol, one-way link, OWL. Everything that OWL does is a one-way link. And specifically here are the communication cards that perform the one-way link. One of these OWL communication cards goes in the source network. The other goes in the destination network. Between these two is a fiber optic cable and data can only go one way, from the source to the destination. We'll cover a lot more of that coming up. We have well over 2,000 deployments globally. We got our start in the US DOD and the intelligence agencies back in the early 2000s. Our product is used in all of the three-letter acronym intelligence agencies in the US. And our product is used in all branches of the uh, DOD, as well as many of the uh, government agencies and the COCOMs and other governmental agencies for cybersecurity. The reason it's used for cybersecurity in the government defense space is there are two diametrically opposed policies on the books. One policy says where you're the owner and operator of a high security network in the government, that network is not allowed to connect and interoperate with other networks. There's another diametrically opposed policy to that that states that if you are an operator of that network and you have information on your network that needs to be shared with other agencies, it's your responsibility to share that information. So the question becomes is how do you share information between networks that are not allowed to interconnect and operate? 
And specifically within the government space, there is a specific product category called cross-domain solution for products that are certified and accredited to meet that market. Owl is one of a small number of US companies that have products that are certified to that level of accreditation standard. One interesting fact about the companies that sit in that pool of cross-domain solutions, there are no quote-unquote firewalls that fit that category. They don't provide enough security to maintain separation of those networks. In the mid-2000s, the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, implemented security guidance to the nuclear power companies that they would install better separation and cybersecurity between their process control plant and their outside business networks. Over half the nuclear power plants here in the US use OWL data diode products specifically to solve that problem and meet guidance. We also sell our product to the fossil and hydro generation companies that need to meet NERC SIP compliance. So if you have customers that fall into those categories, chances are they'd be very interested in this product. And we also sell our product quite heavily into the oil and gas market as well. A lot of the oil and gas companies around the world have been under cybersecurity attack and they have made decisions in many places to augment their standard DMZs using standard firewalls with an OWL data diode in there to put hardware enforced one-way transfer security policies in place. We also support petrochemical, water and wastewater, and mining companies as well. So there's a lot of opportunities out there where companies are looking for better cybersecurity. And our process with them is to explain our technology, the use cases, and see how it can fit into their overall architecture. We have been an Encompass partner since uh, 2013. So relatively new in the, grand, in the grand scheme of Rockwell Automation and, and many of you distributors. But again, this is tried and true technology that we're bringing to the industrial space. So a little bit about cybersecurity. I'm not going to run through all of this, but this is ultimately why we're here. At the extremes, you've got owners that value their assets and threat agents that wish to abuse and or damage those assets. And there in the center are multiple different ways that those threats can be mitigated. And this comes from Common Criteria Part 1, Introduction to the General Model from 2005. So this explains a lot of why we're here. This is cybersecurity as well as physical security with guns, gates, and guards. It all fits into the same category. So I talked a little bit earlier about nuclear sites that we protect. And we are sitting in between three nuclear companies that use OWL's product in order to meet NRC regulatory guidance. So we're surrounded where we stand here today by sites that are secured by OWL. Gartner, just this year, in June of 2015, put out in a presentation a continuum of defense in depth. And the piece that's new to this particular graph or chart is that data diodes are now, now referenced as part of that defense in depth strategy. And clearly what that shows is we fit in between a firewall and an air gap. And I'll show in subsequent uh, slides exactly what that means. And those same slides are also in your handout. So according to Gartner, data diodes are the highest level of network security next to physical separation. Most people say physical separation is not much of a solution because their business economy, their business value typically goes to zero if there's no interchange of data between different networks. So a little bit about what is a data diode. It is hardware-based cybersecurity. This physically is the hardware. This blue card, which is the send only card, goes in the source network. It's attached to a server that collects data from the source network and very specifically allows it out the photo optic transmitter. Directly across from it is the receive card that can only receive data in through the photo optic receiver that allows data into the destination network. These cards 
are built to be one way and one way only. There is no two-way capability in and out of these ports. So what we do, in effect, is we lock down the endpoints of the networks on both the source side and the destination side and enforce in hardware one-way security policy. That security policy can't change. It either works the way it's intended to work or it doesn't work at all. It's only form of compromise is physical substitution. And that's a security profile that our customers very much appreciate it because they know it works one way and one way only. It either works correctly or it doesn't work at all. So hardware designed to be one way and one way only. And because it's designed in hardware, it is impervious to software attack. This can't change. There's no software that runs on here that will change the security policy and let it work in reverse. Nor is there any software that can change on this or software attack that can cause this to work in reverse. It's enforced in hardware, can't change. That's very different than a standard software firewall where you've got software security policies in a box in the middle, if you will. So I talked quite a bit about the, the terminates and protects the endpoints of each network. Why that's important is what the data diode provides is network segmentation with 100% confidentiality between the two networks. The two networks do not know of each other. To go back to my earlier example in the US government, how do you get networks that are not allowed, networks to connect and interoperate that don't know of each other and they're not allowed to connect? So what we do is we implement a non-routable ATM protocol break between the two networks. So we take the incoming TCP IP traffic or the incoming UDP traffic, we extract the data payload out of the UDP or the TCP packet, we put it into a non-routable ATM cell, and we move ATM between the cards. These, in effect, are asynchronous transmission mode cards, ATM cards. ATM is used because the quality of service in ATM, it was designed to move large amounts of data asynchronously between networks, large data rates, high quality, with no packet loss. So what we get with that is quality of service, we get a non-routable protocol break that maintains 100% confidentiality, and it's all forced in hardware, so it can't change. The picture here represents the two cards and the cards that they have here on the table. And between them, we use standard industry optic cable, a single cable. The cable itself does not perform the security policy. So you're not getting security in a cable. The security policy of the non-routable ATM, what that allows for, if somebody were to intercept this cable, the ATM packets don't route. They don't have a concept of a source and a destination header in them. So that's part of the security policy that's built into the ATM cards. Wherever you see this symbol, symbol in our nomenclature, that represents the data diode solution of the hardware ATM cards, our drivers, and our software applications that allow the data to move. In this particular product right here on the table, we've got a miniature version of these ATM cards, physically smaller, so they'll fit inside of a smaller size, weight, and power device. But the data diode concept and what it looks like is very similar. So the hardware circuitry enforces one-way data flow. We call it a dual diode because for every one of our systems, they need two diodes. They need a send-only diode, and they need a receive-only diode in order to complete the data path. And these two cards end up going in every single solution that we deploy, whether it's in two industry standard servers, in a single 1U rack mount system, or in this smaller device. Any questions at this time? All right, we'll keep on moving. So inside of this box here, and inside of our other products, 
this being a representation of what looks like inside. The hardware dual diode, the two communication cards in series, some of the blue and the red, it physically creates an air gap that enforces the network, network separation. There is no electronic trace between these two cards. There is no back channel of any kind, which is the reason we use optic in order to implement the data flow. We also then have IP proxies that sit in the source and destination server that terminate and originate the IP traffic. So the blue side being the representation of the source network, the data flows in through a standard Ethernet connection. Our IP proxy software, either TCP proxy or UDP proxy or file transfer proxy, captures that data. It moves it through the Linux-based operating system. And I'll cover a little bit more of that in, in a moment. It moves it through the hardware communication card, across the air gap, and then the path out in reverse through the ATM communication card to OWL driver to our proxy support, which then distributes that data as a UDP or TCP packet on the destination side. So all inclusive into our solution is the hardware, the drivers, and the software, the operating systems that allow the solution to drop in and operate. And then as I mentioned before, the one-way hardware constrained by a single strand of fiber optic cable. So security attributes that are really important is the routable information on the source network, which is the source and destination header of routable traffic on the source network. None of that IP information ever traverses the data diode. So what we do is we extract the data payload out of the datagram. We put it into a non-routable ATM cell, and we move the ATM cell over a specific ATM channel number. That channel number is the only inside information that goes to the outside, because we have a routing table that sits on the outside that takes that ATM channel number and knows what to do with the data to route it to the final destination. So in that scenario, the inside IP addresses never make it to the outside because having that inside IP address is one of the th first threat vectors that adversaries look for to get from an outside network to the inside network or from the IT, no IT network into the OT network. Talked about the ATM transport, the high speed, high reliability, and the deep protocol break. So I've touched on the protocol break a couple of times. It's a security policy that many of our customers like. The other thing that we do in our solutions is we whitelist the applications or the data flow that we're allowed to receive on the source network. So we only ingest what we're authorized to take in. We do the source authentication and the verification. And then on the de destination side, the routing table very specifically allows that data flow to go to a specific IP address, port, protocol, destination. So we whitelist the source to the end application as another security feature in the solutions. Typically in the process control area, where most customers are using it today, is the source network is the OT network. The destination network is the IT network or the business network. And they're moving information from the OT network out to IT at the convergence point of OT and IT, which typically is that DMZ between the two networks. And the security profile allows OT and IT to peacefully coexist. The data flows out from OT to IT, yet IT is not allowed back in to inadvertently change settings or things of that nature. Okay, so a little bit about standards. There's a lot of standards that are out there. Customers use many different standards when they're trying to go through this process. Uh, many have said, pick a standard, any standard. One is better than nothing to go through and understand how to, how to get through here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ISA 62443. But as I mentioned before, 
the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NERC, NIST, API. There's a whole bunch of different organizations that have developed a lot of different cybersecurity standards. And in all cases, the OWL data diode solutions map to those security profiles. Question? Right, so the question was, how does the source know that the destination got its data? And our answer to that is, because of our history and the performance and the quality of the data diode, we flip the question and say, how does the destination know that it didn't get the data? What's the exception from the rule? We do a lot of different things in the process. One of the things that we do is in every data packet that we send across the ATM link, we include a running MD5 hash number in every single packet. So every ATM cell that comes across the ATM link has a running hash code value in it. We then calculate the running hash code on the destination side, compare those two to make sure that all the information got across the link. We can also do that to the end destination to make sure that the end destination received all those packets and have the ability to monitor the end destination and those applications to make sure that all the data got there. So we monitor every touch point of the data flow to the data diode, through the data diode, and to the end destination. And part of the reason we use ATM is it's highly reliable. What most case customers uh, learn with us, we're always the newest device in the network. So we have to have the big shoulders in terms of operation and performance. Six months down the line, most customers turn around and tell us they start all their network troubleshooting with the data diode because all the logging is so complete. They know exactly what's come in. And if there's been an issue with the source, they know it's gone across the data diode and an issue delivering to the destination. And our devices sit in the middle as that network service that allows troubleshooting to begin at the center and work out. That gets you a good answer? OK, great. All right, so I think I covered everything on this slide, so we'll move on to the next. So some of the concepts that the ISA 62443 standard uses are security zone, the logical grouping of physical, informational, and application assets sharing common security requirements. All right, so as you have different networks out there and different devices within those networks, the security zone and the security level of that zone needs to be identified. And not all of those network security zones are at the same level. Some are higher and lower than others, and some might be peer-to-peer. -peer. But typically, the customers need to go through a process of understanding what those security zones are and the security level of each of those zones. They use the term conduit as the communication flows that, re that represent the information exchanges between those security zones. And there are a lot of different conduits out there. Data diode is one of them. Standard software firewall is another, a switch, a router. There's a lot of different devices that fall into that category. The third one here, defining security zones, uh, the standard says that this really is the most important aspect of the process. Because in this, customers need to figure out what work needs to be performed in a zone, what data feeds and allows that work to take place, and then what information has to be shared between different zones in order to facil facilitate and restore business continuity of data interchange between those different networks. We spend a lot of time with our customers in this particular area because in a lot of cases, and you'll see it in the upcoming slides, it does require an analysis of the workflow, the work rules, and where the work gets done in different zones. Because in order to gain security here, the process is segmentation, segmenting out important aspects of the network that need better and higher security that are more critical to the operation of the business. Other network zones, less security. But understanding what function takes place in each one of those networks becomes critically important for the workflow. So this is a, a representation of a typical network. This is how most customers come to us. 
where they have already implemented a concept of an OT network, some DMZ or series of firewalls for separation, and then they typically have a corporate network or an IT network. And what this typically facilitates is excellent business communi communication and business value. The data can flow between those different networks in order for people to get their work done. We have a lot of customers tell us point blank, this is such limited cybersecurity that they at times get forced into this architecture when something happens where they have to go to an air gap. Now this has its problems as well. You get excellent cybersecurity here, but you have limited or no business continuity or business value because there is no exchange of data anymore. Right? The plant may know what it's doing, but nobody outside the plant has any idea what's going on. And in most cases, that's unacceptable. So the question becomes, is how do you get the best of both worlds? How do you get the value for the business in terms of the data exchange and the cybersecurity close to the air gap? So the big question is, how do you achieve that? The next number of slides are specifically how we help customers go through the process to examine what their operation looks like, the security policies for those zones, and how to implement better cybersecurity. So use a couple of different icons here. We've got an OT network and we've got an IT network. So defining the network security zones is usually the first step. Most customers are usually fairly far down the path with that, although they'll say there might be a lot of other networks that connect through a particular router or switch or something. So they think they've got some segmentation, but not a lot. I talked earlier about defining the work and the workflows and the data needed within and between those work zones in order to facilitate the value back to the business. So that becomes a critical aspect in the process. Then we define the security policies for the, for the network zones and then define the security solution that enables and enforces all of the requirements from the three above. And in the handout that I gave to you, the next four slides are in the center pages. So the first process here is defining the security zones. Um, this may look like a simple use case, but in fact, it's again where many of our customers come to us, where they have the concept of a plant network, they have the concept of a corporate IT network, and they typically have some type of DMZ or zone three and a half or two and a half, depending on, on how they categorize their zones, for some level of segmentation there. But being able to define this is pretty critical. So next, to define the work zones and the workflows and the data transfer within the zones. This becomes a little bit more difficult. Because as you talk about more segmentation between the networks, some of the systems that might have been in the DMZ or in one network that people could access with the TCP IP connection, you might have to start moving those systems around in order to fit in to this model. And then be able to determine where does the system sit that people need to use in order to get their work done, where does the data come that feeds that becomes a critical process in defining the, the data transfers within and between those zones. So in this particular case, the work is being done in, in both of the zones. Because in a simple example, there may be a factory talk historian in the source network. And in fact, there's users in the IT network or the business network that might need to have access to that data. So understanding, again, the systems, where they are, who needs to access them, and the data flows is critically important. Defining the security policy. Well, with a one-way link, one OWL data diode solution will allow information to go one way. And where customers are deploying our solution today is a one-way transfer from the OT network to the IT network, and we sit at that convergence point of IT and OT. 
And because of the threat vectors of people being able to come back into the plant, they want to stop any of that data flow from coming back in. So all of the nuclear power plants that currently have our product installed, they're moving information from the OT network to the IT network. And the government regulation says there's no electronic flow of data back the other way. It's too insecure. So one way out and no ability to get in. And you can see here there's a number of other Rockwell products that we currently support for replicating that data out. Yes, sir? Right. So the so the question is in this particular model with only data flow out, is this too restrictive and do, does not supply enough operational capability to the business? How do they get data back in? The way to think about how data diodes work in this scenario is airline security. Airline security was great until it wasn't in the early 2000s. And what happened? System was breached, major catastrophe, and airport security is now very similar to how OWL has been deploying solutions since the beginning. Airport security is when you're going from the low security zone to the high security zone, you go in through a one-way path. That one-way path would be analogous to your question, how do you get data into the plant? Well, it's a one-way path in. However, just like airport security, there's content examination, there's whitelisting, there's verification, deep packet inspection, all of those capabilities in airline security when you go through security. The OWL data diode for data path that has to go in from low to high also can include content examination, content inspection to allow patch updates, to allow demand orders and things of that nature to go into the process control network. That's another one-way path, again, just like airport security, because when you get off the airplane from the terminal to the curb, you go out the exit door, which is distinctly separate than the indoor. And once you cross the white line, you can't turn around and go back. They've got a guard or two guards physically sitting there to keep you from going in that way. So think of the data diode implementation to be the identical process. That's what we've been doing our whole history. Now, the difference between our two different markets is in the government space, most all of their data transfer requirements are typically from a lower security zone to a higher security zone. So they're collecting information off of open sources or whatever. They need to get it into the uh, process control center where they can examine the data. They use a one-way data path to get data in. They put specific content examination security policies around the threat vectors of the data itself, the files, the file type, file name, extension, um, antivirus. There's a lot of different content examination policies that can go in there. And then for data coming out, typically, once they know it's releasable data, they send it across a one-way path so data can get out. Now you have two very high security controlled conduits that facilitate the data flow in both directions. Now the reason I didn't put that picture specifically here on the board is in the process control industry where we are most of our customers are only at the one way out phase. They've had incidents take place or legislation that says one way out is it, nothing's allowed to go back in electronically. So that's why we're using this use case here to show the data flow out. Now, there is a slide a little bit later that will show some of the other use cases, and it might open up some uh, thought in terms of how it can be used. Okay, so in our example here, number four, define the security solution to support all the requirements. The <coughs> OWL data diode allows that to happen because now what we have are various process controls that are taking place in the OT network. We're allowed to get this data, move the data across to the IT network, and then disseminate it 
to the IT network so people on the outside have access to the data. Another way to think of this model is remote monitoring with no remote access. You have access to the data, you don't have access to the network. We have a number of customers in the process control industry, uh, one of them who's quite vocal down in the, uh, in the south central uh, Texas area. His return on investment and his justification for doing this was, if I can keep my smartest IT staff from getting through the DMZ across the data diode into my OT network, think of who else I can keep out. And he's been able to achieve that because there is no way for anybody to get back across this link going the other way unless they completely bypass it and put something else in its place. Physical substitution is the only form of compromise. Data flow is only one way or no way. And those are two absolutes that have never been disproven. So we sit right here at the convergence of IT and OT with a device that's protected by ST or security technology. So a quick summary on that part. Well-defined security zone and policies equals security standards that have been met. A standards-based separation of OT and IT equals improved OT, IT, cybersecurity. The OT network is secured, which directly correlates to increased plant reliability. I haven't met a customer yet that doesn't have plant reliability very, very high on the list. Cybersecurity is an aspect of plant reliability. It's not everything, it's an aspect. OT data flows to IT. Users have data to deliver business value. Users on the outside have data to get their work done. They restore the business value. Restored business value equals improved business operations. And these words that are up here on this board are words and value propositions that our customers absolutely agree with. And many of these words come from them specifically after we've done the installation. And they say, yes, we've achieved these things with this installation. All right, so another quick summary here. Pick a cybersecurity standard. Pick any standard. Most people will say it. Pick a standard, use it, and apply it. Define your network security zones. Define the work, the workflows, and the data transfers needed to support it. Define the network security policies. And then define the security solution to support all those requirements. That goes for any security device that's out there. Data diode just happens to sit between firewall and an air gap. All right, so some other data flows real quick that we currently handle. RS links, factory talk gateway, factory talk historian. The reason we drop in this area very well, and I'll show you a demonstration of the factory talk historian. Uh, we've been supplying solutions specifically for OSI Pi replication for many, many years. I'm sure most of you know that the underlying uh, Rockwell historian is the OSI Soft Pi. So we have a solution that is built specifically for replicating the Rockwell historian and the OSI Soft Pi historians. These other products up here, as many of you know, Rockwell has gone through the painful process of using and implementing OPC servers in order to collect the data. OWL also has an OPC client server software solution that allows us to collect to an OP, connect to an OPC server on the inside, replicate that entire OPC server across the data diode to an identical OPC server on the outside, now any device that connects OPC to collect the data can connect to our, data, our OPC server and do whatever it needs to do with that data. So with those two applications, we cover a great deal of the, the watershed of the Rockwell product line in terms of compatibility. Other things that we do real quick, we've got an SQL replication solution. We support the transfer of syslogs. So as you have devices that are putting out syslog messages, we can move those syslog messages. We've got an email proxy that supports alarms and events. There's a number of uh, solutions out there or systems out there that use email to send reports or alarms and events. We can support that. We've got a solution that allows us to do remote HMI screen replication. So as an HMI is sitting on the inside, people need access to what that screen looks like. We can replicate that screen across the data diode. 
And I've got an example that I can show how that works. We support UDP, multicast, broadcast, unicast, support TCP IP, file replication for alarms and events, or any file for that matter. Uh, we talked about OPC a little bit already. We support Modbus. This next one here gets to the other gentleman's question about how do you get data into the process control network. We have built a very specific data diode solution for moving software patches into the process control network. The security policy that it uses is hash code validation of every file. The hash code value has to be loaded into the data diode solution before the file gets there. We then run a calculation on the file and compare the hash code all the way up to SHA-256 to make sure that that hash code value is, in fact, identical. And then, and only then, do we allow the file to move across the data diode into the process control network. So that's another form of content examination there, hash code validation. All right, so a couple more slides to give you an idea of where things sit on the network. So this is a real high level. Um, and the data diodes that are represented here, are, our customers use them in, in many different places, but these are all representative where customers are using them. So typically, you've got the OT network and the IT network here, and a data diode that allows information to flow from IT to OT. In some cases, the physical distance between the plant and corporate can be a great distance. So they may have a data diode here to let data out of the OT network, and they may have a data diode at the inlet of the corporate network to allow data into the corporate network. It doesn't just always have to be a one-to-one. -one. I'll show a couple more examples of that. Cases where customers are sending information to their customers, where they need multiple plants to be communicating. Suppliers, there's a lot of uh, OEMs out there that have service level agreements that need to get performance data of their equipment on the outside. And that performance data might need to go to those service partners so they understand usage, performance rates, and things of that nature. And some of our customers use it to connect to the internet. So a lot of different places. The other um, use down here for this particular data diode is you might have discrete manufacturing processes within the plant that you want to further segment. So you could put data diodes within the plant operation. If you go back to the airport security model, if any of you have ever flown internationally, when you come back to the US, there's a checkpoint right at the gate. So you got to go through the high security conduit to get into the terminal, and then you got to go through another security checkpoint to physically get on the plane. That's another example of the inside threat mitigation and further segmentation of the networks there. All right, so another aspect that people talk about is populating the cloud. And the data diode will allow data out of the plants to populate the cloud. And because of the no back channel, Users that have access to the cloud to get their work done, the OWL hardware ensures that none of those users can ever get back to the plant. So you get data flowing from out of the plant to the cloud. Users using the cloud have access to the data, but none of those users can ever get back to the plant. The source of that data is completely unknown to the cloud network. And I'll show a picture of that in a little bit. So the ATM protocol break ensures that no plant IP address ever transfers out of the cloud, which again is security at that level to make sure nobody can get in. So in that particular, your cloud now enabled for the internet of everything with 100% of network confidentiality and no back channel to get to the source. And that's what that slide may look like. So you can have an IT cloud out here. You can have multiple sources that are feeding data into that cloud across different connection variations. Internet, microwave, satellite, phone dial up in order to move the data. Obviously a wide area network, VLANs. The data dials also support full redundancy and failover for those connections that have to be up and operational 100% of the time. In this particular scenario, yep, corporate may be feeding the cloud as well. 
users may have access to the cloud. And then you may also be supplying information to suppliers, partners, customers of the supply chain to have access to that data as well. So a number of different things that we can do there. Okay, so in summary, OWL is security technology. And OWL enables the convergence of IT and OT with ST. We sit right there at that convergence point. OWL hardware security technology that cannot be changed in software or by software attack. One way hardware security tech technology that moves data from OT to IT and ensures nothing and nobody can come back in. And seamless replication of uh, Rockwell Automation Factory Talk, historian, files, alerts, and messages, and other industrial data types. And this is technology that is deployed today and is operational. All right, so I've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to show you a couple of quick uh, demonstrations just to give you an idea of how it works. So up here on the table are two laptops. This laptop on the table represents the OT network. This laptop here on the right represents the IT network. And sitting in between that is one of our devices Connected to the, to the OT network is this blue cable because inside of this box there is a miniature version of the send only data diode card which is indicated right here in the middle and right across from it is the receive only card that initiates the destination network. So what I'm going to show you as an example are a couple of different uh, transfers. One is going to be a file transfer I'm going to show you the UDP capability because a lot of systems use UDP to send information out for alarms and events. And then I'll show you the Rockwell Historian transfer. And if there's enough time left, the last demonstration I'll show you is the HMI replication of taking the uh, HMI screen from the inside and replicating it to the outside. So the one thing I have to say is you do have to uh, bear with me as the uh, monitors switch. The HMI at times take a little while to... Uh, to convert. So what I'm going to show you first is the inside system. So in the inside system, I've got a couple of different demonstrations that are currently running. One is a VLC player that's using a standard VLC player to play a movie and broadcast that movie as a UDP stream <clears throat> to the source side network. The data diode picks up that UDP stream, it transfers it across the data diode, and when I switch the, um, the monitor, you'll see the movie playing on the other side. So this is a great example because there are a lot of systems out there that use UDP as their transport protocol mechanism to move data. And in that scenario, we can drop in and connect, move data, deliver it to the other side, and have it all work out exactly as you're seeing there. So the demonstration is at times a little anticlimactic because it's data on one side and then now on the other. Uh, you'll also notice the background border on this screen is blue. We do that to maintain the color separation. So when I switch it to the other side, you'll notice that it turns red. And it's going to get plugged in right. Again, I apologize for the delay in the transfer here. And there's the video on the red side. You notice the back is now red. So for those of you that are in the front, you have an easier time of seeing the two screens and see that the two screens are near identical. So that's one demonstration. 
Another demonstration that I'll do is a file transfer. And in this window is a repository where this file is going to be deposited. The file is currently sitting there. And when I run the script from the source machine, you'll see that file name change as we're downloading that 100 megabyte file coming across the system. I've got this system set up to be manual, so I'm going to launch a script over here on the source that's going to pull a directory on this laptop where that 100 megabyte file sits, and it replicates it across to the other side. The use case here is there are many systems that output a file. Maybe it's a batch file for a management report, or it's an alarm and event, and it outputs files into a specific location. We can then pull that location once a minute once a second, once an hour, whatever timing is right, to traverse that tree, look for files, and replicate them across. And so I'm going to double click on this script right here, which kicks off the, the batch file. And you can see the file name is now changed to downloading. So that 100 megabyte file is in the process of being transferred from the laptop on the OT network to the laptop on the IT network, and it's a straight stream. Yes, sir? Yeah, so the question is, what's the lag time or the latency between the source and the destination? I'll start with the data diode. The data diode in the middle, latency adds single milliseconds to the total transfer. Typically, from end to end, in a case um, like a UDP packet, we're talking high single digits or low double digits, typically from end to end. But in an end-to-end -end scenario, you've also got to be worried about other devices on the network, other routers, other switches, other hubs, repeaters that might add latency on the source network. And then there may be the same issue on the destination network. But the data diode itself, we're talking single-digit millisecond latency addition to the transfer. Now, there's another file transfer that I'm going to show here. I'm going to take a file from this laptop. I'm going to read it. I'm going to write it to the hard drive on the OWL solution. Once it's written to the uh, hard drive on the OWL solution, then it gets transferred across the data diode and written on the hard drive on the destination side. Once it's written there, another process picks it up and moves it to the final destination. The reason we do that is for a guaranteed delivery system, because from the source to the OWL box can be a bi-directional TCP IP connection with a guaranteed delivery process. Once it gets land, once the file lands on our solution, we then control the transfer across the data diode. It lands on our destination hard drive, and then we use a TCP application to, to deliver it to the final destination for the same type of quality of service. Okay, so this folder. Uh, This folder is the destination, and the source is a folder that has three files in it of pictures of JPEGs of owls. And so I'm going to launch the script that kicks that off. The script is now kicked off, so those three files are now moving from the laptop to the hard drive on the data diode, across the data diode and then delivery to the final system, and you can see those three files have already been delivered. So that's the process of a guaranteed delivery system using TCP IP on the source network to guarantee delivery to the data diode, and then a TCP IP connection from the destination, from the destination side of the data diode to the final destination. All right, so the next demonstration that I'm going to show you is the uh, Rockwell Automation um, historian update. That's not going to make it larger for me. 
So on the source network, there is a Rockwell historian that is running physically on this laptop. OWL has an application that resides on our data diode that reaches out to the historian via a TCP IP connection, it's an interactive connection, that logs into the, to the historian to collect real-time data, snapshot data, archive data, and also we can bring across all the attributes of the historian file itself. So we can bring across all the attributes of the whole historian and have the ability to create a replicate historian on the destination side. What you're seeing here on the red screen is the destination historian. And you can see the points are changing as we're playing back through the database and moving those points across. So in this particular scenario, you've got a historian on the inside for the plant people to use on the inside. You've got a replicate historian on the outside for people on the outside to have access to that historian data. OK? Let me check time here real quick. I've got two minutes. I can do one more demonstration for you, which is the HMI demonstration. Um, give me just a quick second. <laughs> Yeah, so the price point, entry level price point is about $20,000 for the first year for an entry level solution. We have other uh, more enterprise capable solutions that may go as high as seventy or 80000 or even some cases up over 100000 depending on all the attributes that somebody's looking for. So there's a number of different price ranges there depending on the, the volume of data, bandwidth, and then the various different applications that need to move data. Yes, sir? All right, so the question was, within a company, who usually configures and rolls it out? Um, great question. It, it is a service that OWL helps provide. When we go into a client to help roll this out, we typically want to have three people involved in the process. There is somebody who is responsible for cybersecurity. And having somebody from cybersecurity on the team is critically important because, again, you're going back to the cybersecurity policies, threat mitigation. There typically is somebody from OT that needs to be involved because the data is coming from an OT system. Somebody has to know how to be able to, to connect to that OT system. A lot of the IT staff don't know the OT systems. So that's that convergent point right there at times that can be difficult. And then typically somebody from the IT side needs to be involved because the data gets disseminated to an IT system. Typically what happens is we start usually on the IT side because the IT side typically owns firewalls. Not always, but most of the time. They, the IT staff, have the, the business problem of disseminating data to the business staff. The IT staff typically have to work with somebody in OT to get access to that data. The thing that's interesting in the nuclear environment, it started out very much as that, but now these solutions have been installed and operational. The day-to-day the -day care and feeding and the maintenance of the data diodes all resides with the engineering staff which typically is much more on the OT side. The reason being is usually where the data diode gets installed is at the outlet of the OT network, not the inlet of the IT network. And that's a real important distinction in terms of who owns it. So typically what happens there, OT gets data out. Once it gets across the data diode, typically the OT says, I'm done. You have your data. What you do with it now on the IT side is up to you. So it really becomes an OT protection device. How do you configure it? Do you guys have a separate software package? Is there weapons? Yeah, so the question is how do we configure the device? Great question, because in the earlier part of the conversation, I mentioned there's always two halves to every solution. Each half is administered independent of the other. So you can have complete access and role separation of the admin staff 
OT only admins the OT side, IT only admins the IT side, the piece that has to be in collusion to get a data flow across is that ATM channel number. So OT can say, yeah, that data flow is coming across on ATM channel 123, IT needs to configure it. So the rest of the configuration is port protocol source IP address and ATM channel. So we need to know what IP address data is coming to us from, what port, what protocol is being used, and what ATM channel number are we sending data across. On the IT side, it's the exact reverse. They need to know what data flow is coming across an ATM channel. They need to then know the destination IP address, the port, and the protocol in order to disseminate that information. And those routing tables are in software in the data diode and administered completely independent of each other. Um, no, actually, it's a, it's a, the question was, is it through a web-based interface? And, and the answer is no. It's not through a web-based interface. We deploy our solutions on Linux. We've gone to a menu-driven role-based access control menu system. And the reason we've gone to a uh, text-based system is we take out the web interface because many people will say that's one of the most insecure packages in Linux. So we've taken that out. We go to a menu-driven command system with a username, uh, password in order to access the system. And then we have four different role types within that user configuration, all the way from a, a, an all-knowing capable admin to only an auditor who can only look at and then access the logs. And then other few role cases where people have the access to, to monitor uh, or, or change the system. The other thing that we do in our system that's very different for self-protection is once that security profile has been set up in those routing tables, we then calculate a hash code value of those critical operation files for both sides of the system and give the users the opportunity to run the hash code validation against those system files while the system is in operation. And if it notices a change to those critical files, it can alert and notify of that change and it can shut down and alert and notify of those changes. So it has a lot of self-protection built into it as well. OK? All right, so the last thing I'm going to show you real quick is in this window is an HMI screen that's waiting for the screen replication on the other side to come across. And I'm going to go into my application here on the source side. I am going to launch an application. that will, when this application gets launched on the blue side, it's going to run a uh, Windows application that does a screen scrape, pushes it all across the data diode, and you'll see this window populate with information. So in this window now, is the source screen. And as I do things over here, they get replicated to the outside. The admin sitting on the IT system has access to the screen, but they can't do anything to get any command and control signals back into the source network. So a couple of examples of how data diodes get used in the, in the real world. If there's no other questions, I'll let you guys move on to the next part of your day. I think I gave you about 10 minutes to do the transition. Thank you very much for your time.